Have you ever stood in a dark basement, a bit like this, for about eight hours? Have you ever held your hands up in the air and have you ever waited for a bass line to kick in? Have you ever stood in a queue for a long time waiting for your favourite DJ to arrive? Or have you gone, ever gone to see a local hero uh, down your local club? It's hard to put into words the commitment that clubbers uh, hold towards clubbing and the music, the intense enjoyment and euphoria that clubbers uh, experience from their leisure time pursuits. For the most part, clubbing isn't a commitment to getting high, much as politicians and the media would have us believe. That's not to deny that some people get into trouble from recreational drug use. Um, I think that recreational drug use can be a, a commitment to a hedonism that in our 24-hour consumer culture fits in quite nicely. And for some people, drug use can spiral out of control. But for the most part, and for most drug users and for most clubbers, that's not the case. Clubbing tends to be a commitment to partying, to remaining respectful and tolerant to others around you, uh, and for once, uh, and for one night usually, uh, not getting into fights over spilt pints or knocked elbows. So my name is Dr. Karenza Moore. Um, I'm an academic at the Lancaster, at Lancaster University, and I've been researching clubbing for a long time now, since the 1990s. Um, I won't say my age. Um, and I've published about 30 academic articles about, um, about the subject. So I wanted to talk to you tonight uh, basically about the historic and enduring role of uh, drugs in club culture. The first thing I wanted to say really was just how uh, much time, investment, effort uh, clubbers put into their nights out. And for the most part, clubbers uh, manage to have nights out, trouble free, don't get themselves into fights. Um, and uh, basically have a good time. And sometimes I think that's forgotten, particularly in the kind of drugs research that I'm involved in. The other thing I wanted to say is, um, particularly in the area of drugs research, uh, there's been a very uh, a kind of concentration on the spectacular aspects of clubbing, uh, so the kind of hands in the air moments, you know, the rush of ecstasy. And actually, what's been forgotten is the kind of mundane aspects of clubbing. So, as I mentioned, you know, queuing up to see your favourite DJ, uh, trying to get tickets for the, the, the gig that you want to go to, and obviously, uh, so for some, sorting out uh, drugs, which can be quite a hassle. The other thing, the other thing uh, is the technologies um, that are involved in clubbing. Um, and again, there's been quite a concentration on DJ technologies, uh, obviously the technology that creates the night and the club, uh, the venue. Um, but what we're seeing now is the use of technologies to kind of create clubbing communities, to sustain clubbing communities. And that's something else that uh, academics uh, like myself have become more and more involved in, is looking at how clubbers uh, use technology as well. So, things have changed rapidly. We've had about 25 years now of uh, Raven club culture. Uh, and I think sometimes it's easy to forget, you know, how we got to where we are uh, now. So, um, just to remind you, um, 1988, uh, obviously ecstasy, and we saw uh, Shorgin there. Um, I always feel like I should say MDMA after watching that. Um, obviously, Shorgin didn't like the label ecstasy, but that's the, the name that we... Uh, 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 use most commonly. So ecstasy was central to the birth of rave. We also saw a moral panic about rave and again for those of you that are old enough to remember we had uh, Leah Betts who was the kind of anti-E uh, poster girl uh, for, the, for the rave era. We've kind of seen a, a repetition of this for example with the death, uh, GBL related death of uh, the medical student Hester Stewart, and that was covered a lot in the press as well. So there has been this theme running over the last kind of 20 years of particularly white women's, women's uh, vulnerability to drugs, which the media have picked up on uh, and to a certain extent run with to demonise uh, rave and club culture. Uh, in 1994, we had the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act, uh, which basically uh, criminalised outdoor raves and moved raves into uh, licensed premises. Uh, and actually, uh, that was uh, mirrored by aggressive marketing by the alcohol industry. Um, so again, we had things like alcohol pops. We've now got things like shots, where alcohol is marketed almost as a psychedelic uh, substance uh, or, and an intoxicant uh, marketed to young people. So we saw the, the move back into licensed premises and the, uh, the arrival of alcohol back onto the dance floors uh, of uh, rave and club culture. 
And for those of you that think, you know, so what, we don't care about Criminal Justice Act, uh, Criminal Justice Raves Bill in 2008 basically uh, reinforced police powers uh, in relation to raves uh, and to a certain extent recriminalised them uh, and set up preemptive clauses such as is likely to set up a sound system. Uh, so I don't quite know how they know that, but obviously if you look like you're about to set up a sound system, you could get yourself into trouble. There has been a wealth of research. There's been a wealth of research on uh, clubs and, uh, and club drugs, starting with uh, what we call the grandfather of rave research, Dr. Russell Newcomb, uh, who set up the Rave Research Bureau in uh, Manchester in the early 1990s. In 2001, uh, a colleague of mine that I work closely with, Dr. Fiona Meesham, uh, undertook the first major study of club uh, drugs and clubbers' drug use habits with a sample of over 2,000 uh, clubbers. They found that 94% of clubbers had tried an illegal drug at least once in their lifetime, and 36% of clubbers had planned or had already taken ecstasy on the night of the survey. Now, what's interesting is um, over the years, we've seen a change in the drug habits of clubbers towards a more kind of pick and mix approach. Uh, so polydrugging, uh, polydrugging has um, uh, become the norm, basically. We've also seen a growing division between uh, alcohol-focused clubs, uh, called what, what we call binge, brawl and pool nightclubs. Uh, and this division has kind of grown, really, between those kind of nightclubs and uh, drug-focused uh, dance, electronic dance music clubs as well. And that kind of division, I think, is quite problem problematic, really. Obviously, in post-rave club culture, there's also been a lot of uh, developments, co constant innovation in music tech, uh, DJing skills, uh, that kind of thing. But in the face of all this innovation in the post-rave uh, club culture, uh, some things remain the same, and that is <laughs> the persistence of ecstasy. <clears throat> so ecstasy, MDMA, uh, remains a Class A drug, despite downgrade recommendations for, from, for example, the Association of Chief Police Officers, ACPO, who recommended in 2005 that ecstasy should be downgraded to a Class B drug. Clubbers love ecstasy. Uh, it's estimated that 5 million uh, pills are consumed every month. That's figures from uh, the Advisory Council for the Misuse of Drugs in 2009. The, the quality of ecstasy dropped below what Shorgin calls an active dose. So uh, ecstasy was about 40 milligrams, if that, uh, in most ecstasy tablets from about 2008 to about 2010, early 2011. What happened was some form of displacement. So clubbers moved to MDMA powder, which is seen as a more kind of premium product. The idea was that uh, you know, you'd get more MDMA for your money if you bought powdered form. And we also saw the uh, arrival of methadrone, or MCAT, or as the media called it, meow meow. No one else called it that, but... <laughs> So, uh, MCAT, and, and it was interesting, MCAT, methadrone, is actually amphetamine, it's habit-forming, so I think that's an instance of where if you have low-quality ecstasy, people displace to drugs that might actually be more problematic than ecstasy itself. Po uh, methadrone's popularity has, has waned in the last year or so, although we did research in uh, South London uh, gay clubs, and it was actually found that in those particular spaces, methadrone was still very popular. So. Uh, it varies, drug use varies very much between different scenes, different genres uh, and different uh, clubbing scenes, basically. We've seen in the northwest of England, we've come down from Manchester, uh, the return of the £10 pill, which has been kind of welcomed by uh, clubbers, to say the least. That's basically the return of an active dose uh, pill, so 100, oh, either 100 or over 100 milligrams of MDMA in each uh, tablet. So ecstasy has got a uh, continuing symbolic and material importance for club culture. So for example, in uh, Fiona and I's most recent surveys in Manchester, uh, across five different dance clubs, uh, we found that 42% of clubbers had taken or were planning to take ecstasy on the night that we surveyed. So over 40%. Over As I said, ecstasy isn't the... Uh, whole story and Clubland has kind of developed over the last 25 years. We've seen a diversification and a splintering of the scene. 
Uh, and we found this again in our uh, research. So we surveyed uh, three drinking destinations in Manchester and five uh, dance clubs in Manchester. Um, and, I, and again, as I mentioned, there was this real pick and mix attitude towards uh, drugs. What we found were there were significant differences uh, between bars and clubs, uh, particularly dance clubs. So in the bars, eight out of 10 club goers had uh, consumed uh, an illegal drug within the past month. However, in the bars, that was uh, 40%, so about half. 98% of dance club customers had tried an illegal drug at least once in their lifetime. And 79% of dance club customers had taken an illegal drug within the last month. And what was interesting when we looked at, uh, you can see the different genres of music there, um, and we only you know, managed to cover uh, four altogether, there's obviously lots more, uh, were the differences uh, between different uh, genres. So hard dance was the highest use of ecstasy uh, and the highest use of illegal uh, drugs more generally. 71% had consumed an illegal drug on the field work night and 62% in trance uh, nights had consumed an illegal drug. 60% uh, in house and 61% uh, uh, elite had consumed illegal drug on the field work night in drum and bass. And what was interesting was people told us whilst they were drinking, and as I mentioned, we'd seen alcohol coming back into the scene, whilst people were drinking, their aim was not to get drunk. And that was the main difference between these kind of venues and what we call the binge, ball, brawl and pool venues. Um, so it does make you question, given these levels of drug use, uh, you know, what, what's the, 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 the point really of policing the drug laws uh, and what about the drug laws? What, what have we seen in relation to drug laws? So these are uh, the drugs that, ha since 2003, so nearly 10 years, uh, these are the drugs that have been made illegal. Now most of these uh, in the UK, most of these drugs are used recreationally, although uh, number four, methamphetamine, has been linked with uh, um, habit-forming problems. Um, and again, GBL is very big in the gay scene and that has been uh, linked with quite a lot of habit-forming problems. So we've seen this kind of cat-and-mouse game of proactive prohibition and there's basically little or no evidence that criminalising these substances uh, has actually uh, affect availability or uh, use patterns amongst clubbers. So what I'd argue really, instead of this form of criminalisation, we need some kind of harm reduction. The other thing we need to ask ourselves um, is why are they criminalising these substances? Why is this happening? Really, is it about the government being need, uh, needing to be seen to do something? Or is it maybe a broader issue of uh, concern about what young adults in particular are doing during their leisure time? One of the starkest issues in relation to um, criminalisation and drugs in clubs is the position of ecstasy. And as I said, it remains a class A uh, drug. The question we have to ask ourselves is, what's the point of prohibition? <clears throat> so, whether or not the classification system acts as a deterrent uh, for clubbers in general. For some, there's a confusion about classification. So, in the work that we've done with teenagers, most teenagers have absolutely no idea what class certain drugs are. Uh, and that wasn't helped by uh, some of the kind of to in and fro in around cannabis, so from C to B and back to, uh, uh, back to B again. For clubbers, uh, and those that take ecstasy in particular, uh, the contradiction in classification is really stark. So clubbers want to know why is ecstasy the same classification as heroin, uh, given the problems uh, that heroin uh, uh, forms for people. And for the majority, most people are unlikely to take drugs regardless of the legality. And we saw that with legal highs, that actually most young people don't take legal highs. So even when drugs are legally available, um, that you know, young people aren't really that interested. In terms of the blight of drug laws, one of the things, uh, and I think this was uh, pertinent for the, the summer riots uh, in London and in Manchester, is about stop and search. So stop and search, I would say, ruins community relations. Criminal record, I've seen this again in our research with young people, diminishes young people's life chances. Also, young people tend to be quite reluctant to seek help uh, about, you know, if they are experiencing problems with drugs because they have the image of a junkie, you know, the junkie stigma in their, in their minds. So they don't perceive themselves like that. If they are experiencing problems, then it's quite difficult for them to actually come forward. 
And also, uh, and this is not me that's saying it, it's the, again the Association of Chief Police Officers. In the age of austerity, the enforcement of possession, again, particularly cannabis possession, is uh, a waste of public money. So there are some well thought out alternatives. Uh, for example, there's a charity called Transform, uh, which is fantastic, uh, and it's published, published uh, um, after the war on drugs, a blueprint print for regulation, which sets out not just this idea of let's just decriminalise uh, drugs, but actually think about how we could actually regulate them. And again, especially in relation to club culture, it's not necessarily just about the criminalisation of drugs, it's about a criminalisation of a cultural form. I think we've heard here today quite how positive uh, electronic dance music culture has been and is for uh, young adults. Uh, this is one of my favourite quotes from some of the interviews that we do with club prov promoters that says, uh, really telling it like it is when it comes to um, promoting dance music and creating events. So, last form. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh